Well, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm great. I'm I'm glad that you're here this morning, and it's our desire that uh, that as we gather uh, to worship, that we will turn uh, away the things of this world, and that we will truly focus upon God, and uh, and that we'll we'll begin to allow the Spirit and the presence of of God uh, to come over us. Uh, and so I also just want to remind people that, um, that if you have things that need to come to the office for, uh, that you want to make sure that the word gets out, please send it to communications at sunburyumc.org. That's where we gather all that information and, and make sure it gets out. So please make sure uh, that if you have something that needs to go out to the uh, congregation that you would uh, that you would use that email address. Likewise, uh, we're still collecting wheelchairs. If you have a wheelchair that you are not using or that you no longer have use for, we're collecting wheelchairs for the honor flight. Uh, and, uh, and so um, we're gonna do that through the end of October. So if you, would, uh, if you have one, you know of one, you've got a friend who has one and they are not using it or don't think that they'll need it and they're just wondering what to do with it, it's uh, parked in the garage instead of the car, uh, then uh, uh, bring it and, and uh, we'll consecrate it and we'll uh, uh, make sure that it gets to uh, those that need a wheelchair to make that flight to Washington, D.C. October the 22nd, uh, a big day for us as a congregation. It allows us to once again uh, have an impact and a touch to our community. And so uh, we have our fall community uh, uh, event festival that's on the 22nd. It starts at 5 and will end at 7.30. Please, uh, in the next week or so, there should be a sign-up sheet, or you can, uh, uh, in the next week or so, there'll be a sign-up genius, or in the next week or so, you should be in touch with uh, Matt McKelvey who, and, uh, or Jim Troutman, who are co-chairs of our missions committee. And they can tell you, hey, here is a way you can plug in and be a part. It's anything as, as simple and easy as putting a hot dog in a bun. Anybody done that before in your life? It, it can be that simple. And handing it to someone and saying, enjoy. Uh, it can be as simple as, as just standing there at the pumpkins and talking with young ones that are, are joyful about decorating their pumpkin. Uh, for this harvest season. Uh, it can be bringing a car, tractor, boat, uh, four-wheeler, whatever the case is, and putting it in the lineup for uh, our uh, trunk and treat, or boat and treat, or tractor and treat, or four-wheeler and treat. So please be a part of that and sign up. And you can decorate it in any way you want. So. Uh, uh, those of you who know of my service dog, Charlie, who is, a, a, in essence, a, a cuddly ball of fur, uh, we decorated him up as a guard dog one year. And, uh, and he couldn't even bark. So, so please, be a part of this. This is, this is us as a congregation. Be a part of it. Okay? Um, lastly, I don't know whether you've heard or not, but uh, there was uh, uh, some unfortunate events that took place at our homecoming this last Friday. Uh, and, um, and so um, uh, where uh, uh, I believe a young boy tripped and was run over by one of the floats. Um, to the best of my knowledge, several broken bones in his face, broken ribs, uh, laceration on his liver. He's in the hospital right now. And so uh, we certainly want to keep, uh, keep him and their family uh, in our prayers. But more than that, it's my understanding that, um, that they either it's the nephew of the man who runs Fun in the Jungle, uh, or it's one of his employees. I'm not quite certain on that yet. 
So we're reaching out to fun in the jungle. I mean, we, we're with them all the time and, uh, and letting them know it's a, good, it's a good touch for us to say, we're here for you. Uh, thank you for being there for us when we want to use your place. So let's just take a moment and let's have a word of prayer for uh, this uh, young boy uh, that's there. Keith, would you be willing to lead us in that prayer? Sure. All right, thank you. morning. Uh, please join us in the gathering from Psalm 19, which is responsive. All right. <coughs> Almighty God, your words are worth rise like a glorious sunrise. You speak and our hearts rejoice. You command and our eyes are opened. The sound of your voice brings revival to our souls. Your words are purer than the finest gold. True and righteous one, living word, light our way. As we listen to your spirit, may the words of our mouths, the words of our hearts, be accepted in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen.
I'm going to talk about some uncomfortable things this morning. Because this is what, uh, well, let me just say it this way. I've been a Christian for a long, long time. And I've been a pastor for over 40 years. And after continually reading God's holy words year after year after year, and after years of my faith continually being matured by tests and trials, there's one thing that I've come to learn. That faith is alive. It has never died. The church is alive. It has never died. What I'm saying is this, that the church is a living organism. And we all know what living organisms do. They shift and they change to meet the present needs all while remaining true to the core, to their purpose. Let me translate this to the church. The church is a living organism. If it does not shift or change to meet the needs that are present in its time and place, And if it does not, in that change, remain true to the core of our doctrines and faith, then it will truly die. Amen. I don't practice my faith the way I did when I was 20 years old. I have learned new songs that touch me and move me to worship God in the same way that some of the other songs have touched me and moved me to worship God. I have seen different styles of worship different than what I experienced in my younger years, yet between that spectrum, they both and all of those expressions in between move us to worship God. And a faith that does not show does not show it being a living organism, then is a faith that is dead. If a church does not practice its mission and goals without meeting the current needs of our community, is dead. Well, you know where that led me, right? I started to think of the many places that Catherine and I have been so privileged to worship. Places that we've been privileged to, to walk alongside churches and individuals as they begin to understand that faith and Christian life is living. It's a living thing. We do not serve a dead God, we will often say. Then why do we allow our faith to die? Why do we allow our churches and the way that they operate to die? So I started to think of those expressions, and then I thought, oh my goodness, you'll never guess what today is. Anybody know? It's World Communion Sunday. I can only imagine that every congregation that is meeting today will have 
exactly the same worship that we're having today. Correct? They will be singing the exact same songs that we are singing today. Correct? They're going to hear the exact same message, right? Every pastor that stands behind the pulpit is going to be bald, right? You see, the sun first rose today over Mount Hapka. It's that highest point in that tiny Chapman Islands in the South Pacific. That's where it first became World Communion Sunday. And I started to, to think, I wonder how they're going to celebrate communion today. It's going to be like us. Well, I found out that it wasn't. Christians in the Chapman Islands, they gather under, a palm, under palm trees today on the beach to sing and to pray and to break loaves of roti to remember Jesus Christ. Oh, before too many hours have passed, over three million South Korean Christians are, are lifting up their hearts and voices in praise of what Jesus has done for them. You never guess what they do. They, they shared loaves of rice flour bread. While just a few miles away, Members of the newly reopened Christian community of North Korea, I believe there's only three churches there currently, are worshiping publicly in that country, and they're using the words of the great thanksgiving. They're saying the words, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna to the highest. That's how they're experiencing and worshiping on this World Communion Sunday. Oh, some of those churches in India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, some of the poorest countries on this earth, They, they've taken their communion bread. The uneaten bread that they served for communion. They took them to the children in the streets who were, were begging for food. There's Christians in Sudan, the Sudanese Christians, still fearing for their life to openly express their Christian faith, are secretly meeting in homes, all knowing that someone could walk into their house at any time and arrest them in that civil war, civil war torn land, all to share in this in this World Communion Sunday, there are some army chaplains who are, are dressed in fatigues, camouflage clad U.S. uniforms, and they're serving soldiers around the world who still find themselves in harm's way. So there's a, usually there's a prohibition against what is called shared communion. If you're, if you're a Catholic, you go to a Catholic chaplain to receive communion. If you're Protestant, you go to a Protestant. If, and, and, but it's being ignored. As chaplains offer the bread and the 
open cup to anyone who desires to observe the sacrament of Holy Communion. Catherine and I were privileged to serve in Asia as missionaries, as well as Africa. We took our language training in Europe. We had Scandinavian friends in language training school. They experienced it differently, their, their communion practices and liturgy, all while remaining true to the core of, of giving thanks and praise for the wonderful, grace-filled gift that God gave us. You know, in New York City, Port-au-Prince, Rio de Janeiro, Christians are gathering, all receiving this incredible gift which was shared to the world in different ways. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian in Havana or whether you're a Christian in Hartford or whether you're a Christian later on in St. Louis. Los Angeles and, and Honolulu, you will all be, they will all be celebrating communion differently according to what they need to celebrate this special day. Now this morning, right here in our city of Sunbury, the churches are celebrating, the cup is being lifted, the bread is being broken, and, and, and people are invited to come and to, to be a part of this feast that gives us new life, eternal life, to drink from the cup of the covenant that, that binds and liberates us all. A continual 24 hours of the Lord's Supper encircling the entire globe and everyone doing it in the way that their community needs to feel the grace of God. You know, even in the midst of, of scenes of violence or in Florida today from recovery from natural disasters, it doesn't matter whether you're, you find yourself in poverty or wealth. The church as an alive, living organism celebrates this holy day understanding that the movement of Jesus Christ in our midst breaks into lives in the same way the broken bread we take into our lives. It's a way of showing that salvation is not simply for those that, that make their way into the doors of the church, but salvation is supposed to go out from the church. To commune with those who see themselves as undeserving. For those that find themselves thinking that God's grace can never come to me. Life is just so messed up. I think today of, of, of the possibilities of people that are crossing our man-made boundaries and barriers simply to receive this gift. And I think back of Jesus' earthly ministry, which also challenged boundaries and barriers and divisions that were set up by people and between people. And the breaking of that is never made more clear than at this table that we will celebrate from this morning. It doesn't have to be the way that it has always been. It shouldn't be the way it has always been. Because you and I are not the people we used to be. In fact, when Jesus introduced this, to the people of his days, he was criticized by those who had religion down pat. Criticized for breaking bread and breaking the law with those who were outside of the in group. Sitting down and developing a relationship with those who were, 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 were unscrupulous in the in the receiving of their, their wealth and those who were undeserving in the poverty that they found themselves in. 
sharing the faith with men and women alike. With those that are, are deeply engaged in, the, in the, the dogma and doctrine of the church. And yet, with those who are morally suspect. Oh, he was able to heal by bringing people together by saying the faith does not always have to look like this. Your faith if expressed to God in a true heart can look like this and it will be, it will be good with God. The disciples witnessed this firsthand. And this is where our text comes in. They see how freeing this is and they say, Teacher, increase our faith. We want to be like that. We want our faith to be living. We want, we want our expressions of, of God to be seen as something that, that can reach across boundaries and barriers. Increase our faith. Increase our faith. That should be the prayer of every faithful disciple, right? It should be the prayer that we pray in every circumstance, right? It should be the longing in our heart, correct? But as I recently read the results of a brief survey on faith in America, not around the world, in America, which was conducted by the Independent Pew Forum on Religious and Public Life. Those that took the survey were asked basic questions about Christianity and other world religion. They were asked about famous religious figures and, and constitutional principles of governing our faith and religious life. And on average, I want you to hear this. On average, people only got 50% of the questions right. Yeah, you heard me correctly, 50%. You want to know who topped the top of the list in knowing who got these answers right, 50% right? Atheist. And agnostics. They did the best in the, in the survey. They knew all about 50% of the time. That, those of us who were Christians. In fact, let me just give you the whole list. Atheists, agnostics did the best, followed by Jews, Mormons, and Protestants near the bottom of the list. Increase our faith. It came out of a sense of inadequacy. Knowing we didn't have the answers. I don't, you say, well, I don't have the answers. Increase my faith. And, and in some way, Jesus' response seems like, yeah, yeah, increase your faith. That's what you need. But Because you see, if you only had more faith, then you'd be able to, to, to work wonders and miracles. You'd be able to get out there and, and, and live the life that you're supposed to live. That's how I picture it in my mind. But the more I look at it, we got it wrong. We have made faith into a thing. We've made faith into a commodity. Something we, we can grab a hold of and something we can hold on to, something we can purchase, something we can acquire. But faith is a gift that God gives us. It's not something we, we acquire. It's not our faith that needs increasing. That's not what Jesus is saying. When he says, you can take a faith the size of a mustard seed, and it can be transformative. What Jesus was saying is, you've got enough faith. You're just not putting it into practice. Jesus seemed to think that the disciples already had enough faith to do what they were being asked to do, to what Jesus had called them to do. They had enough faith. 
Because you see, I found this in those years that I've been a Christian and been maturing and been pastoring. The faith is a funny gift. It's a powerful gift. It only increases by use. It's the only way it increases. You can't put another quarter in the, in the offering plate and get another portion of faith. It has to be used. We think we don't have enough. We need more. We need more. We need more. We need more money. We need more people. We need more this. We need more that. But God is saying, use what you have. Can you imagine church putting its faith into action? Even a small bit of faith can transform the chaos of the ocean. You can find it in the Gospels. Just think of when you plant something in the soil and it takes a, just a tiny seed that you have faith that it will come up and it will grow into something and produce something that you can eat. Because it changes. It doesn't stay the way that it is. If a seed planted in the ground stays the way it is, it will die. It will never be any good. So my friends, as we think of this, our communion table, the place where, where we touch and taste that reality of God's faith, here is through that little chunk of bread and that little swallow of grape juice. We become connected, our faith becomes connected to each other, with each other, with the family of God, with the community of God, around the entire world. Here we partake, brothers and sisters alike. We partake as families. We partake as strangers. We partake in different stages of our lives. Oh, how sad it would be if we simply said, this table is only for those who are still working. We cross those barriers, my friends. We're joined together. It's here that we become companions, which I love that word. Look up the word companion sometime. It literally means the ones who break bread together. We become companions with Christ. We're united, not only with us who are living, but with those saints who have departed and who have, who have used their faith to build this place. The truth of the matter is that when faith is practiced, it becomes as large as the spinning world today. It's as transformational in Africa as it is in Haiti. As it is in Tokyo, or as it is in Los Angeles. It becomes transformative for men and women. For young and old, for rich and poor, for those that are at the end of their rope and those who see a bright future ahead. And all I can say is, thanks be to God that faith is living, it's alive. That the church is living and alive. Let's plant with hope, with faith, that fruit will come forth. And it's time. So today as we celebrate World Communion Sunday, I invite us now to symbolize that universal scope by praying for the life of the world. And I've invited individuals to come and to guide us in, a, in a Native American traditional prayer that at certain points in time you will be asked to respond out loud by saying, come, gracious Holy Spirit, come. Can we practice that right now? Come, gracious Holy Spirit, come.
Gracious Holy Spirit, come. Come, gracious Holy Spirit, come. We turn to face south. We thank you for what you have created out of your people around the world. We pray for your spirit of innocence, trust in your ways. We pray for your community in the south. Help us to open our eyes to the sacredness of every living thing and to be good stewards of the abundance you have made and provided for all people. We pray and join in your gift of communion together. This is our prayer. Come. Gracious Holy Spirit, come. Turn with me to face west. We turn to face west. We thank you for your love for all people. Help us to be a welcoming congregation filled with your love. We pray for your spirit of introspection, for seeing within and discerning your way. We pray for your communities in the West. Give us your strength and the courage to persevere and practice what we have seen in Jesus Christ. As we pray and join in your gift of communion together, this is our prayer. Come, gracious Holy Spirit, come. Turn with me to face the north. We turn to face north. We thank you that all creation points us to you. We pray for your communities in the north. We pray for brothers and sisters everywhere and for your spirit of wisdom and grace to become pacemakers and bridge builders and reconcilers with one another. As we pray and join in your gift of world communion, this is our prayer. Oh, gracious Holy Spirit, come. Breathes life into every being as we pray and join in your gift <coughs> of communion. This is our prayer. Come, come gracious, gracious Holy Spirit. Spirit. Come. come. Take to dwell with God that 
Come, gracious Spirit, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. The Spirit is meant to be shared, my friends, in a variety of ways. Receive this bread and share it with those that you meet. In the same way, he took the cup that night. It's the cup of Elijah, the cup of suffering. My friends, we live in a world which is suffering. It's meant to be shared. We do not suffer alone. Christ suffered with us and for us. And likewise, when we leave this place, we should share in the suffering of all those that we meet. That is what a living faith is all about. That's what a living church is supposed to be. That's who we must become. As we've been invited to come for the gracious Holy Spirit to come in our midst, I invite you to come as well. The communion rail is always open. Come as you're ready. Stand as you're able and join us.
Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>